Well, good morning. Really good to see all of you here today. Appreciate you being here. Man, I love the church. I love this church. And uh, we're going to have a good time here together today. We're in the third part of our Unshakable uh, sermon series. We've been looking at the prophet Daniel, looking specifically at the test that Daniel faced. Because the tests that Daniel faced in his life are the tests that you and I will face in our life. And if we can learn to pass those tests the way that Daniel passed his tests, then our lives can become unshakable. And today we're going to look at when your beliefs are belittled. What do you do when your faith comes under attack? Starting about the age five, you spend about the next two decades uh, getting an education. And the Bible tells us that an education is a good thing. Proverbs 19.8 says, Do yourself a favor and learn all you can. Then remember what you learn and you will prosper. So if you want to prosper in life, you want to get an education and remember of what you learned. Now, an education doesn't end when you graduate from school, either high school or college. If you're going to be successful, if you're going to prosper, you're going to be learning your entire life. A lifelong learner. Proverbs 24, 5. Wisdom brings strength and knowledge gives power. You want strength, you want power in your life, then you've got to be a learner. You've got to be pursuing knowledge and pursuing wisdom. It's just a good investment it's a good investment of your time, your energy, your money, because it's an investment in yourself. So the Bible says that you also need to guard your education. In other words, you've got to learn the right stuff. Proverbs 4.13, your education is your life. So guard it well. And the question I have for you students is, are you guarding your education? And you parents, are you guarding the education of your kids? Are you making sure they are learning the right stuff? Now Daniel faced tests in his life. In the first week, we looked at the test of a major shakeup in your life. What do you do when the foundations of your life are shaken? The second week, we looked at the pressure to conform. What do you do when you're confronted with peer pressure in a hostile culture? And this week, Daniel faces the test of a challenge to his faith. And that challenge to his faith comes in an educational setting. What do you do when your faith is belittled? Find it in Daniel 1.4. Uh, Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. And so Daniel and his three friends were chosen for this educational program. And at first glance, it may look like a great opportunity. But the reality is, most of what they were going to be taught is going to be totally anti-God, anti-Bible, certainly anti-Jewish. Uh, Daniel 1.4 in the message paraphrase says, Indoctrinate them in the Babylonian lore of magic and fortune telling. Because the Babylonians were pagan. They were incredibly superstitious. And so these guys are going to have to learn a whole lot of stuff that they don't agree with. But God prepared Daniel and his three friends. In verse 17, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And these guys had already passed some major tests. The major test of a shakeup, the foundation of their life was shaken, the major test of peer pressure. They passed that test, and now God's given them a bigger one. This test is, can you study in a pagan school and not lose your faith? Sound familiar? I mean, this Babylonian school system is totally ungodly. And so they're going to have to learn all these myths, superstitions about false gods, occult practices, phony science. They're, they're, they're not going to be trained in truth. They're going to be trained in falsehood. They're going to be taught to be fortune tellers and psychics. And Daniel and his friends are going to have to exercise significant discernment in order to separate the fiction from the fact. Verse 18. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, 
the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. You know why? Because they were speaking to the king out of truth, not out of fiction and falsehood. And Daniel and his friends, they were 15 years old when this thing starts. They're 18 years old when they graduate. And now they are advisors to the most powerful man in the world at that time. How do you learn what the world wants to teach you without losing your faith? Because your education is only as good as the content that you learn. I mean, you can go to school your whole life, but if you're learning fake, false, unscientific, untrue content, it's not going to help you. And frankly, that's what we're faced with in our culture. In 1962, the Supreme Court took the Bible and prayer out of school. For over 300 years, the Bible had been the primary textbook in public education. And frankly, it's what made our country so great. But every one of the Ivy League schools was started by pastors to train pastors. All the education in America was Christian, biblically based uh, at the start. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all started by pastors to train pastors. But the Supreme Court took 300 years of the Bible out of the public schools. And the problem isn't just that they took a religion out of the school. The problem is that they put another religion in. Because they took Christianity out and they infused it with secular humanism, which the Supreme Court itself has ruled is a religion. And so for the last 50 years, if you grew up in public education, like I did, you probably had some teachers who belittled the Bible, attacked your beliefs, contradicted your values, laughed at your morals, values, and ethics. And if you're a college freshman in particular, a secular teacher, an atheist professor can be extremely intimidating. But there are a couple of things you need to know. One is the actual number of real atheists in the world is quite small. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, only 2% of the world's population claim to be atheists. Now, sadly, most of them are college professors. Okay? <laughs> but you need to know that the world is actually becoming more religious, not less. Now, the future of the world is not secularism. The future of the world is religious. And just to put this in perspective, about 15 million Jews uh, are in the world. Uh, about half of them in the United States, another half in Israel, and then some of them are just kind of scattered around. 15 million Jews. 600 million Buddhists in the world. Most of them live in Asia. There are 800 million Hindus. Most of them live in India. There are 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. Most of them are spread throughout the Middle East and down into Indonesia. And there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world. One out of every three people is a follower of Jesus Christ. And Islam and Christianity are the two fastest growing religions in the world. Islam is growing through birth rate. Christianity is growing through conversion. People are making the decision to believe in Jesus Christ. But the majority, the vast majority of the world is religious not secular. And, but the public schools, particularly colleges and universities, are the primary bastion of unbelief. And so I want us today to look at how do you excel in school? How do you graduate at the top of your class like Daniel did when you don't agree with the stuff that you're being taught? How do you do that without losing your faith? You, know, you learn a lot of good stuff in a public education, in secular schools. But you are also exposed to stuff that is contrary to what the Bible says. And it's in very important areas of your life. It's in where you came from, it's who you are, it's in your identity, it's in your sexuality, it's in your meaning and purpose for life. Very crucial areas. So how do you excel in your education in the face of a hostile culture? Today, I want to give you six things that will help you with that. And I know most of you look like you've graduated from school, okay? 
But this, this is a lifelong issue. This, this is how you face the same issue in your business. You face the same issue in whatever area of life you're living in. And so number one, you need to decide in advance to stand for God. Before you go back to school, before you go back to work, you need to choose your loyalty before the test happens. Got to decide ahead of time. 2 Timothy 3.12 Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. And I think that's every one of you because that's why you're here. You want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. But look what it says. It says that person will suffer persecution. If I'm living out my Christian faith, I'm going to face opposition and harassment for my faith. If I'm not experiencing persecution for my faith, maybe I'm such a chameleon that people don't even know that I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. And parents, you need to prepare your students for this. You should expect your faith to be challenged at some point during your two decades of, of school. Because during your education, you're going to have lots of tests. Geography tests, history tests, math tests, English tests. The most important test that you'll ever take during your education is going to be a pop quiz. You're not even going to see it coming. But someday, at some point in time, you are going to be challenged for your faith in Jesus Christ. It's the big test and you've got to be prepared for it ahead of time. Daniel 1.8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself. And so the starting point for you as a student, starting point in any area of your life is to, to make a commitment to protect your mind, protect your body, your heart, your soul. You know, I'm doing the best I can in this education environment, the best I can in this work environment, but you decide in advance that you're going to set some boundaries to protect yourself. In our student ministry, Pastor Andrew calls them guardrails. That's what our students are studying this summer. How do you build guardrails into your life that will protect your faith? How do you go to the top of your class? How do, how do you become a great student in that kind of environment? Proverbs 1.7 says, start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their noses at such wisdom and learning. Why? Because God is the foundation of all truth. God is the source of all knowledge. He's the source of all wisdom. And the problem today is a lot of people know a lot, but they don't know what's most important. They don't know God. Proverbs 15.33, reverence for the Lord is an education in itself. Why? Because God is invented everything else. God invented biology and physics and astronomy and anatomy and social studies and geography and art and music. God is the one who invented all of that. And so you've got to decide in advance that he's going to be the foundation upon which your education is based. Second, second key, you never stop learning. One of our slogans here at Rockbrook is all leaders are learners. The moment you stop learning, you stop leading. And, you know, great businesses want, uh, require growing business men and women. Growing churches require growing pastors, growing people, growing leaders. And so I just would ask you, what's the new skill that you're going to learn next? You ought to be intentionally looking for, what, what's the area that I want to learn something in order to improve? Because you never stop learning. Proverbs 18, 15, wise men and women are always learning, always listening for fresh insights. 2 Timothy 2, study, circle that word, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that isn't ashamed. God wants you to study, to be a student. One of the purposes of this church, of God's church, is discipleship. A disciple is a student. A student is a disciple. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you're going to be learning your entire life. Proverbs 19.8, those who get wisdom do themselves a favor, and those who love learning will succeed. You want to succeed in your marriage, in your relationships, in your career, in your finances. Those who love learning will succeed. Now, it's important to understand the difference between knowledge and wisdom, because they're not the same. You need them both, but they're not the same. Because knowledge is information. Information gained through education or experience. Wisdom is seeing and responding from God's viewpoint. That's wisdom. 
Wisdom is seeing your relationships from God's viewpoint and responding accordingly. Wisdom is seeing your finances from God's viewpoint and responding accordingly. It's seeing uh, your job from God's viewpoint and responding accordingly. That responding, obeying is a crucial part of wisdom. Because lots of people have knowledge, but they're not wise. And that's why their lives, why their relationships fall apart. I mean, you can have multiple degrees and go through multiple divorces. And you can have lots of education and go bankrupt. Because you have knowledge, but you don't have wisdom. You're not seeing it from God's viewpoint and responding accordingly. And and you don't get that from knowledge. That comes from wisdom. It comes from your relationship with God. Because once you get wisdom, now you start understanding the meaning of things. Who am I? Why was I made? What is my purpose? How am I supposed to live? I mean, there are lots of people with degrees who are still asking those questions. Because those don't come from knowledge. They come from God. Which leads to the third thing you've got to do. I must steep myself in God's word. And I use the word steep for, for a reason. I mean, you know what it means to steep a tea bag. You know, you take a glass of hot water, you take a tea bag, and you dunk it in it. And what do you do? You leave it in there, and you bounce it up and down. What happens if you just dunk it in and take it out? You wind up with a wet tea bag and dirty water, but no tea. Okay? <laughs> No, you got to leave it in there. You bounce it up and down. It takes time to make tea. The same thing is true with God's Word. Uh, too many believers are using the skip and dip method with God's Word, and, and they're, it's not being effective. It's not making a difference. you got to read your Bible every day, and you got to spend time. you got to let it steep. You pick a verse, you meditate on it. You familiarize yourself with it. You internalize it into your heart and life. Why do you do that? Look at Joshua 1.8. This is a promise. This is a promise from God that you can claim. He says, study this book of instruction. And notice, it's a book of instruction, not just information. It's instruction. The difference between information and instruction is instruction is something that you follow and you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey, circle that word, everything in it. You've got to obey, you've got to do what it says. Only then. Only then. You can come up with your own plan. It is not going to work. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. It's a promise, but it's based on the premise that I'm going to learn the truth in order to discern the lies. You know, there are lies all around you. Worldview lies, cultural lies, moral lies, political lies. The world is filled with lies, things that simply are not true. You lie to yourself all the time. And the reason why so many students, so many adults today are fallen for unbiblical ideas in our society is because they don't know the truth of God's Word. And if you don't know the authentic Word of God, you can't spot a spiritual counterfeit. If you don't know the truth, you can't spot a lie. And, but the more you know the truth of God's Word, the more you can discern the lies. Now, one of our small group studies at Rockbrook is the Foundation Series. And it is a study of basic Bible doctrine. And it gives you a foundation of the truth. And if you've never worked through that material, I'd encourage you. This fall, maybe you need to even host a small group where you just host it and play the DVD and work through it in order to get, in order to get the material. But you need to work through that so you can establish a foundation of truth for your life. Because Psalm 119, 104, your commandments, that's the Bible, commandments, give me great understanding. It's no wonder I can see and hate every false way of life. If, if, if I know the authentic, I can spot the counterfeit a mile away. There, there's too many lies out there. You're not going to study all the lies and know which ones are, because Satan can come up with a new lie every minute. But once you know the truth, then you can spot the lies immediately, because they're not the truth. 
And in this indoctrination program, Daniel is having to learn all kinds of stuff that he doesn't believe in, that he knows is not true. But that's okay. He's mature enough to handle it. He can learn this stuff. He can ace the test. He can graduate with honors. But it doesn't shake his faith in God. Why? Because he's built his life on the foundation of the truth, the foundation of God's word. Now, if you're going to spend more time in God's Word, you're going to have to watch less TV. Because the time has got to come from somewhere. Did you know that by the time you reach 18 years of age, <clears throat> you will have amassed 30,000 hours in front of a screen? Video games, computer games, watching your phone, watching a TV, 30,000 hours looking at a screen by the time you're 18. Do you know how long it takes to read the Bible from cover to cover? 80 hours. 80 hours. So by the time you're ready to go off to college, you will have logged 30,000 hours of screen time, but have you ever carved out 80 hours to read the Bible in order to have a foundation of God's truth? Proverbs 15, 14 says, A wise person is hungry for truth, while the fool feeds on trash. You've got to make a choice. You've got to steep yourself in God's Word. Now, we tend to beat the young people up on this because of the video games and all that stuff. But I tell you, you adults, you need to spend less Facebook time and you need to spend more face in the book time. Okay? You just need to do that. Your life will be better. You'll succeed. You'll spot more errors and, and everything will be better. You've got to steep yourself in God's Word. Number four. Fourth essential. You choose believers as my best friends. The reason why Daniel and his three friends make it through this indoctrination program with their faith intact is because they're in a small group. They've got each other. Now, God wants you to have non-believers as friends, too. God wants you to love everybody, be kind to everybody. God wants you to share the good news with everybody. So God wants you to have non-believers as friends. But over and over and over again in the Bible, the Bible tells us that our best friends need to be strong, strong believers. Because it is far easier for people to pull you down than it is for you to pull people up. And so you've got to spend your time with people who, who are trying to do the same thing, that are encouraging you and building you up rather than pulling you down. Ten years from now, what kind of woman do you want to be? Ten years from now, what kind of man do you want to be? And I can tell you, I can tell you what kind of man and woman you're going to be without even knowing you. If you'll tell me two things. If you'll tell me who your friends are and what you read and watch. Because the people you hang out with and the stuff you put into your mind determines your future. And it's just that crucial. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Anybody want to give a testimony on that one? And we've all had uh, been pulled in the wrong direction by foolish friends. And I just want to confess to you today that when I was in high school, before I became a believer in Jesus Christ, I was the foolish friend that your pastor would have warned you about. Okay? I was the foolish friend that your mother didn't want you to spend time with. And your pastor and your mother were extremely wise because I was dangerous. I was dangerous, and I would get you into trouble, and I would wound you, and I would lead you into sin, because that's where I was living. I would drag you down into the muck and the mire where I was dwelling, and I would do it as quickly as I could. And thank God, when I went to college, I had some friends, some Christian friends, who put in solid boundaries, solid guardrails in their lives. They held me at a distance, but they offered me a hand to Jesus Christ. And God reached down into that muck and through the witness and testimony of those people pulled me up and changed my life. But I was dangerous. And I, I've seen this from both sides. I know how this works. So students, you're going to be going back to school in about a month. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it's just the truth. And so you need to be asking, how do I intend to select my friends? 
typical answer is, I'm just going to show up at school, hang out with some people, and some of us will become friends. But your friendships are far too important. They're far too great an influence on your life for you to leave this to chance. You've got to be intentional, even strategic, about your friends. And you've got to decide in advance, especially if you're going to a new school, you've got to decide in advance what kind of friends you want to have. Because the Bible says there are people you want to stay away from. Proverbs 14, 7, stay away from fools or you won't learn a thing. I mean, that's just pretty clear. But how do you identify a foolish friend? Let me give you an exercise I did a number of years ago and really helped me in my own life and in, in, and in dealing with friendships. There, there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. Between now and the time school starts, you can read a chapter of Proverbs every day. And so I'd encourage you to just take a sheet of paper, make two columns on it, and as you read through Proverbs, write down the characteristics of a wise person in one column, write down the characteristics of a fool in the other. Because Proverbs clearly identifies the person who is wise and the person who's a fool. And then when you go back to school, you start looking for people who are living out of that wise column. And you make sure you're living out of that wise column yourself. Because you want to be the kind of friend that you're looking for. And if you will do that, you will be amazed at the quality of friendships that you'll have this next year. And you will be amazed and even pleased at the uh, issues and incidents and, and troubles that you avoid by choosing good friends. Now, I've got a word for you parents as well. The Bible says not to waste money on a student who doesn't want to learn. Proverbs seventeen sixteen. It is senseless to pay tuition to educate a fool who has no heart for wisdom. And in our culture, it just seems to be a matter of course. A kid graduates from high school and we send them off to college. And many times we send them off to college hoping they will grow up. Sometimes we send them off to college because we just want to get them out of the house. Okay? But let me tell you something. College is a very expensive and a very dangerous place to grow up. And we don't do a lot of our kids a favor by sending them off before they're ready. You would be better off to let them stay at home and work until they have a heart for learning, a heart for wisdom. And then you can pay their tuition. But listen, I've spent a lot of my life in college classes, lots of my life. And I've seen a world of difference between some 18, 19-year-old kid who walks in there and has no interest in really learning and a 28-year-old guy who's in there because he's desperate for a way to provide for his wife and family. There's a tremendous difference in a learner's spirit. And don't, don't fall for this, this trap that we just need to trot them off into those atheistic, uh, horrible locations with no groundwork, and all they want to do is it's all about the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. No, your Bible says you're wasting your money. Well, that's the least of your concerns. You're, you're putting your kid in danger at that point. You want to wait till they have an interest in learning. Psalm 1 de describes how we get trapped by this foolish, bad friend deal. There, there, there's a deterioration that we see. It says, the people God blesses. Do you want to be the person God blesses? Then don't walk with those who suggest wrongdoing. Don't stand with those who like to sin. And don't sit around with cynics who deny God. So you, you, you don't walk with them. You're not headed in the same direction as them. Because that leads to standing around with them. And standing around with them leads to sitting around with cynics who uh, deny God. You don't want to do that. You want to choose believers as your best friends. Number five, you want to stay connected to a church, small group, and a ministry. Because all three of these are crucial. They're essential in the life of a student. They're essential in every life. Because you need input, you need support, and you need output. And so, if you're, especially if you're going to go off to college, you need to look for a church family to, to get plugged into. You need to connect with a church wherever you're going to school. Because let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Circle that phrase, not give up. Study after study after study has shown that the reason why students lose their faith in college is because they stop doing the things that made them spiritually strong. They trot off to a new town, a new college, they stop going to church, they don't get into a small group, and they're not involved in ministry. 
That's why our student ministry here at Rockbrook is based on the premise that we want our students plugged into the church, not just off somewhere as a youth group, plugged into the life of the church. We want them in a small group and we want them involved in a ministry. Because that's how you stay firm in your faith. And and, and at college especially, you want to be going to church because you do not want to miss what God has to say to you. You need the input of worship. You need the input from those sermons. And I can look back on my life, and the steering points in my life were sermons. Not every one, but there were crucial sermons that steered me in making life decisions. What if I decided to stay home that day or sleep in? What if I would have missed that input that directed my life? You know, don't give up the habit of going to church. You need that input. You also need a small group for support. A small group is like a campfire. You know, you look at a campfire and you have a pile of hot, red, glowing, living, warm, light-filled coals. Okay? That fire is alive. And you reach in there with a pair of tongs and pull one of those coals out and you move it just inches away, what happens? The fire goes out, the life goes out, the light goes out, the warmth goes out. It turns into a cold, dead stick. You pick it up, you put it back into that, that campfire, what happens? It springs to life. It comes alive. It's warm. It's hot. There's energy. There's life. There's light. It's living again. That's the power of fellowship. And if your faith has grown cold it's because you're not spending enough time in fellowship. You, you've gotten out there in the world by yourself, maybe just inches away, but your heart, your heart has grown cold because you're not meeting with other believers and you've lost your support group. It's crucial. Third thing, you need a church for input, you need a small group for support, you need a ministry for output. You may not know this, but the greatest defense of your faith is involvement in ministry. The thing that will grow you the strongest in your faith is involvement in ministry. Look at this, 1 Peter 2.15. It is God's will, this is what God wants, that your good lives, okay, that's the act of doing ministry, that your good lives should silence those who foolishly condemn the gospel without knowing what it can do for them, having never experienced its power. The best antidote to a skeptic, to a critic, to an attack on your faith is simply to live a good life. To be involved in ministry. It's the most powerful defense of what you believe. It is the thing that will help you grow the most. You've got to have a church, a small group, and you've got to be involved in a ministry. Number six. When you're belittled for your faith, you need to remember that God will reward me. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 5. He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. What happens when you're belittled for your faith? What's your response? Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you take a stand for your faith, you're in the same category as Daniel. You're in the same category as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And if you will do what Daniel did, if you'll do these six things when you're belittled for your faith, you will become unshakable. Let's start planning now. In July to be able to do these six things in August when you go back to school. Let's pray together. Would you, would you just pray, just say, God, I, I want to excel in my education. I, I, I want to be successful in my career. I want to prosper in my life, and I do not want to lose my faith. So I'm deciding today in advance to stand for God. I'm making up my mind like Daniel not to defile myself. So God, help me to never stop learning, to value knowledge, to value wisdom. God, help me to see and respond to life from your viewpoint. God, I want to learn the truth so I can discern the lies around me. And help me to choose believers as my best friends. God, right now, be preparing 
good, solid believers for me to connect with. Turn me into a good, solid believer that people want to connect with. And help me to stay connected to my church, to a small group, and to be plugged into a ministry. And God, help me to remember, even when I'm attacked, you have promised to reward me forever. God, I thank you that you love us enough to send your son to die for us. God, may we love him enough to live for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.